One of the things that I believe the role of the Attorney General is is to be a consumer advocate for Minnesotans, right? That is the When Tim O'Brien and State Representative Deborah Hillstrom talked on November 2nd about her interest in becoming Minnesota's next Attorney General, only three Democrats were seeking state DFL party endorsement for a run at the Attorney General position. Lori Swanson, the current state AG, had yet to say that she would run for re-election or run for governor in 2018. This is Democratic Visions. Here's Tim. State Representative Deborah Hilstrand has announced that she'll run for Minnesota Attorney General, but only in the event that incumbent Lori Swanson does not seek re-election. Deborah Hilstrom, a Democrat, has represented voters in Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Park District since 2001. That's almost nine terms in the Minnesota House of Representatives. In January, Deborah took a leave of absence from her job as criminal prosecutor for Anoka County, but recently resigned to dedicate more time to winning the DFL party endorsement. Deborah Hilstrom, welcome to Democratic Visions. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about your background. I know that uh, uh, you've been an advocate uh, for consumer issues during the, your time in the legislature, but uh, what other issues uh, were near and dear to your heart while, while you were serving? I've served in the legislature since 2000 and I've worked on many different issues over time. When you first come to the legislature, the speaker decides what committees you serve on and we had a Republican speaker. So he placed me on the Public Safety Committee and um, so I got to be really good in that area. Um, I also was very interested in the Commerce Committee, Education Committee, Ways and Means. And so over time, the issues that I've been able to work on um, have been expanded. But I have spent a large amount of time working on issues related to vulnerable adults, uh, children who are in the child protection system, um, and uh, those kinds of issues. Well, that's interesting because I'm aware of the fact that in 2017, uh, you received the AWARE Award. Uh, that's uh, from the Minnesota Battered Women's uh, Association. What were the circumstances behind that? Do you, do you Certainly. Think? So um, serving in the area of public safety, I've worked on issues um, related to sexual assault, uh, domestic assault, and um, I carried some legislation that became law and they honored me um, at the AWARE Award. Um, in my previous job as the Anoka County uh, Attorney Prosecutor, um, I pr also prosecuted financial exploitation of adults in later life, abuse, neglect, domestic assault, sexual assault. So do you think that was the basis for your other award? You probably have multiple awards, but I'm, an, I'm aware of another award in 2015 from the Minnesota County Attorneys Association uh, uh, for uh, uh, again, having to do with protection of uh, vulnerable adults. Is that, uh, was that the circumstance behind that award? Uh, yes, and so I received an award from the uh, Minnesota County Attorneys Association about access to justice, access to justice, making certain that a uh, victim's rights are heard, making certain that they have the opportunity in the courtroom. Um, whether you're a victim or whether you are a perpetrator of a crime, we all believe that everyone deserves access to justice. I have to say that it, probably sort of a unique position that you find yourself in where you're running kind of on a provisional basis because uh, you and I both appreciate uh, uh, the incumbency of uh, Attorney General Laurie Swanson, but uh, indications are that uh, she may well run for governor, which would then open up uh, the spot uh, for the Attorney General. What uh, What's going on in your campaign? I mean, are you just uh, kind of sniffing around the edges or are you out there uh, hard and heavy? Well, so I resigned from the Anoka County Attorney's Office um, so that I can uh, campaign full time. Um, I also serve in the legislature, so the legislature does take some of my time. But um, I've been traveling around the state. I've been at 150 events giving speeches, uh, telling folks that I'm interested in being the does next Does this count as 151? <laughs> Uh, well, put it on your list. Please. All right, I will put you on my list. So, um, been traveling the state, talking to voters about um, you know my interest in that position and, and the skills that I have, and how I would love to be their strong advocate uh, in the event that position is open. So, tell me, how does your skill sets uh, transmit into an effective state attorney general? I've had the opportunity to pass statutes that protect consumers, and so I've worked with this attorney general and the previous one, um, taking on banks and credit card companies and debt collectors, um, and I've been doing that my entire career in the legislature. Um, and then as a prosecutor, I've actually been executing many of those in the courtroom um, as well. So I carried the vulnerable adult statute in 2009. It defined what is in a vulnerable adult, 
How are they financially exploited? What are the rules surrounding it? And then in my job as a prosecutor, I actually prosecuted cases where people financially exploited vulnerable adults. So tell me what it means to have carried the, that important piece of legislation. What, what's entailed within that uh, undertaking? Sure. So I was the chief author of the proposal. There was also a, a chief author in the Senate. And you navigate it through the committee process, right? You get <laughs> testifiers to testify in support of it. You get stakeholders to agree. You make any changes that need to be changed. And ultimately, it was Governor Pawlenty who signed that legislation. It was a bipartisan uh, piece of legislation defining um, what is it to financially exploit a vulnerable adult. What other policy initiatives and priorities uh, have you been involved in? What would you hope to accomplish as uh, Attorney General uh, uh, after uh, 2018? As Attorney General, the, the job is to take on the issues. Anyone who seriously and persistently violates the law, the Attorney General has the authority to go after them in court. And so we are seeing that um, our current Attorney General has been going after the cable companies because they've been promising one deal and giving another. Um, we've seen debt collectors being taken on. And I worked with uh, Attorney General Swanson um, there were some debt collectors that were actually in the hospital, right? So How does that work? patients would go to see a doctor at the hospital, and the debt collector would be there saying, "Oh, you got to pay for the service before you get seen by a doctor." So Attorney General Swanson chased that debt collector out of this state. How, how prevalent was that practice? Um, it was actually more prevalent, prevalent enough that the Attorney General ran that company out of this state. Oh. And so that is some of the issues then that I've worked on in the legislature as well to make certain that that can't happen. Um, I've worked on the foreclosure issue with the Attorney General's office. And so I believe that I have an interesting or a unique set of skills that make me uniquely qualified in this race. Having actually tried cases, arguing a case before the Minnesota Supreme Court, having worked on the very issues that um, the Attorney General's office has been working on over the years. You need a strong advocate, a strong consumer advocate in the Attorney General's office looking out for Minnesotans because far too often Industry wants to put their finger on the scale and well, let's not talk make about it that. fair. I, I know that uh, uh, Attorney General Swanson has been uh, fighting uh, uh, contracts that obligate uh, consumers to uh, forego any litigation rights and again uh, instead resort to uh, what I would call pact arbitration. Right. You know, I stated that problem correctly? You have. So arbitration, um, there's a role for arbitration when it's a, a, a non-biased arbiter. But when someone you mean some of this not paid by one of the parties to the exactly arbitration? Exactly right. Really? Exactly yeah. right. But so there have been arbitration <coughs> agreements where the company makes you sign an arbitration agreement, and then it's their arbitration company that you have to use to arbitrate your uh, grievances. That's wrong. It's not fair, and that is one way that people put their finger on the scale to make it unfair. Um, and I don't believe those should be enforceable. Now we're starting to see things that the federal government are um, making some changes, but I've been a very, very strong um, advocate for Minnesotans to make certain that um, they are not caught up in a, a system or a situation that is not fair where industry has the upper hand. Well, I want to get into uh, some of the uh, more specific uh, areas uh, that you want to pursue as Attorney General, but I'd like to take step back and take a sort of a bigger overview. The Trump administration is uh, trampling over basic human rights and uh, has taken uh, unilateral action through executive orders to uh, uh, undo much of the Obama administration accomplishments. In response, the Association of Democratic uh, Attorney Generals in the country have uh, uh, processed, uh, joined together to process lawsuits against the Trump administration. Do you think that's a good idea? And if elected uh, Attorney General, would you continue that process? Sure. So um, I think that when you can have um, attorney generals from across the country work together, whether it's just Democratic attorney generals or Democrat and Republican attorney generals working together to solve problems through the courts, I think that's an important thing to do. And you are seeing that Democratic attorney generals from across the country have been stepping up and suing um, where they believe their, their states uh, uh, citizens have had some violation or had some harm. So in Minnesota, uh, our attorney general uh, sued under the travel ban sued under DACA. The, the ban that wouldn't allow uh, uh, people from certain uh, areas of the world into the country? Correct. And so uh, DACA has to do with um, children who were brought to this country by no um, fault of their own as children. Um, Minnesota. Well, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a fault that they're brought here. They just happen to be here. Correct. 
the Minnesota Attorney General joined in that DACA case. Um, there also is a case um, on what the Secretary of Education is doing on uh, student loans and private colleges. Uh, Minnesot Minnesotans um, shouldn't have the contract pulled out from underneath them when they made agreements, when they signed up to go to college, whether it was their student loan or whether it was the rules related to private colleges. Without due process, they shouldn't be allowed to change those rules. Um, Minnesotans deserve to be protected. So you're seeing a Minnesotan, Minis the Minnesota Attorney General's job change in that now there are those suits. But now you're starting to see even bipartisan suits as well. And you're seeing attorney generals from across the country, both Democrat and Republican, taking on uh, this opioid epidemic, right. right? And that is not a partisan issue. That is a new role uh, for Democrats working together. You're seeing- Well, no, I just want to pause for a second. Sure. Your recitation is tremendous, but let's talk a, a bit about the opioid. I think, the, are those lawsuits primarily uh, focused on the manufacturers of these opioid products that have, shall we say, fraudulently uh, disseminated those out into the public under uh, the guise that they're relatively harmless and uh, you can take them for virtually any kind of pain that you might have. Have I stated that sort of in a capsule? You have, and so that's where you're starting to see the investigation be bipartisan. Um, there's been some news lately about how those laws changed here in the country and who <laughs> was active and involved in those. And attorney generals, again, bipartisanly have stepped up and worked together to deal with this issue. Um, the Minnesota Attorney General and the Wisconsin Attorney General partnered with a Democratic uh, Senator and a Republican House member and they uh, did a public service announcement uh, program so that uh, Minnesotans could see what the opioid crisis was about and to educate folks. And so some of these issues um, aren't just about Democrats or Republicans. They're about doing what's right for Minnesotans and Americans and making certain that you have an Attorney General who steps up when they can uh, when you have the resources to do it and you have people in your state who are suffering real harm um, that's the time when you need to step up and, and we have an attorney general who's done that and that's the kind of attorney general I would continue to be. I don't want to get too deep into the weeds here but uh, any individual attorney general can prosecute a, a case of that nature if they so choose. What do you think the advantages of uh, multiple state attorney generals getting together to uh, work on those kinds of matters? Well, any time that you can show that it's more than just your state um, who has harm, um, people understand that it is more serious. And then you have um, the resources, the ability to share resources. You have the ability to... Um, uh, we heard from the Washington Attorney General that because Minnesota joined the case on the travel ban, that there was a different result because Minnesotans had the real child, the four-year-old who was turned back, who couldn't come um, to back to Minnesota. And so um, anytime, you, ha you have to prove a case in court, right. right? You have to have the ability to show that there's real harm that's mm -hmm. happening. Um, and no matter what state it's happening in, if your Attorney General has the ability to show your state or your citizens are suffering real harm, uh, then it's appropriate to join in those lawsuits. Now you can't join in every one because every lawsuit um, is different for each state. So in Minnesota, for example, there are, um, there are different rules that are being changed on campus sexual assault at the federal level. And you are seeing that folks are- Not necessarily are, for the better. No, and you are starting to see that some attorney generals are exploring what they should do about that issue. Now Minnesota is in a different place because we actually passed a statute in Minnesota about how those cases should be dealt with. Give me a thumbnail sketch of that if you would please. Well, so um, it was a bipartisan mm -hmm. proposal and we mandated how college campuses have to deal with campus sexual assault. We uh, make it so that students have to know what their rights are. We have both, both the uh, reporter and the person who is accused, they have to know what their rights are. Um, if someone wants to report anonymously, we've set up a system where they can do that so that mm -hmm. then later on should they come forward and file a police report that their initial report can be matched up with the report that they later make. Mm -hmm. And so we have done everything we could think of that we could work with um, in Minnesota and pass bipartisanly um, to put Minnesota in a place where our students could be protected. Do you, per do you perceive that that's, that legislation was addressing a unfortunate but uh, prevalent uh, problem out in, in, in the uh, academic world? It is an unfortunate and yes it is far too prevalent. Mm -hmm. um, anytime uh, someone is touching you in a way that you don't want to be touched, um, it's a crime in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a crime. Good. So um, so we needed to make certain that our students were protected and they know what their rights are and they know who to go to and if they didn't want to come forward and have their name attached to it right away, we have set up a system where um, they can report anonymously and later on that report can be matched up with the report that they make when they attach their name to it. 
Well, if, if uh, Attorney General uh, Swanson was here, we would both uh, commend her for her service. And uh, I know that you've indicated that you'd like to continue uh, uh, her policy of representing the consumers uh, on a diligent and effective basis. Do you have any other ideas of uh, where the Attorney General's uh, role could be perhaps expanded to help uh, protect other rights of Minnesotans? So um, we've noticed over time, my time in the legislature, that um, folks like to cut state government. And so, oh, <laughs> the Tim Valenti <laughs> crowd, pull, yeah. pull the bathtub. Uh. So we've seen cuts in all sorts of areas. And so we need to make certain that the Attorney General's office has the resources that they need to take on all the cases that they can. Um, not only do you need to address the consumer protection issues, now you have the new, um, you need to hold the government accountable as well. So um, there has been a new expanded role for the Attorney General's office. Is the legislature uh, adequately funding that new expanded role in your in your opinion? I believe that every year the Attorney General's office put forward, puts forward a budget um, asking for uh, the amount of money that they need and I don't think that the as of recent years, the Republican majority in the House and Senate have funded that. Mm. Um, they've actually cut. Mm. And so um, we need to make certain that, look, the Attorney General is Minnesotans lawyer. That is their job. The job is to make certain that when you can, you can put together cases, investigate cases, put together cases, and hold people accountable when they don't follow the law. And then, if there's a gap in the law, to advocate for a change in the law. And um, you need to make certain that the Attorney General's office has the resources they need. And that is also a reason probably why, why folks are banding together, right? If Attorney Generals across the country can work together to address some of these issues, then each and every one doesn't have the whole um, cost of their own. What, have, you, have you given any thought to, uh, particularly when you have a Republican uh, legislature, as we unfortunately presently do, what your position might be if they were to pass what you consider to be a blatantly unconstitutional law? Would you uh, have second thoughts about enforcing that, or do you feel that goes with the office and you have to enforce virtually any statute that comes your way? Well, ultimately, when you uh, pass a statute, um, it is the Attorney General's office responsibility to uh, defend uh, the administration. They aren't necessarily the legislature's lawyer, and you're mm -hmm. starting to see, right, the legislature is suing the governor more yes. often than not, right? So you're starting to see many more of these issues end up in court. Mm -hmm. So the attorney general has a job to either represent the governor or the administration. And so you saw in One this, or the other? You can't well, stand on the sidelines? If if the, so for, the, for example, in the case that's going on about funding of yes. state of the legislature right now, the governor chose to go with outside counsel, but the attorney general's role is to represent the commission of MMB, right? So there is a oh. role to play. Oh. Now, whether the governor's position and MMB's position is the same, a lawyer's job is that you have the client, the state of Minnesota. Oh. Now, the attorney general also has inherent authority of their own, and you saw that in the um, in some of the other cases, um, especially related to the uh, civil commitment of sexually psychopathic oh, personalities, yes. right? Oh. The governor had one position and one lawyer, the attorney general's office had another position and another lawyer, and a lawyer from the attorney general's office represented the Commissioner of Human Services. And the federal judge had a third opinion and the Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit had a fourth opinion. Correct. So, uh, so uh, one of the things that has been of interest to me, because I've been sort of following it carefully and I have a definite opinion on it, uh, has to do with uh, the so-called private prison uh, phenomena that we see across the country but also here in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. What What is the status of uh, uh, the state's position relative to private prisons at this point in time? So when I first got elected to the legislature, Minnesota leased a private prison. Leased? Leased. And so they uh, sent uh, folks out to a private prison, um, and then there started to be issues. And bipartisanly, um, well, issues in what context? You mean they, 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 run, they weren't running the prisons correctly? The guards didn't seem to have a, a information as to what they should do or weren't acting properly? So it started that we weren't exactly sure what the issues were. Okay. And so we started to have hearings bipartisanly. Gotcha. And um, we found both uh, Governor Pawlenty ended up uh, weighing in as well um, and Steve Smith. Former Governor Former Pawlenty, Governor Pawlenty, And let's yes. hope he's always former Governor Pawlenty. Yes. 
Pawlenty. Former Governor Pawlenty um, <clears throat> agreed to stop housing prisoners at Appleton. What we found is that they were cherry picking which prisoners that they would take. They would only take the cheapest uh, prisoners. Anybody who had mental health issues or chemical dependency issues, they wouldn't um, take those folks. They got, an, um, they got an option as to who they were going to take? They did. And so um, they had um, higher incidences and they were having other issues across the country higher. Um, numbers of escapes, higher numbers of assaults. And so <laughs> bipartisanly, the legislature and the governor just decided we were going to stop leasing beds there. Mm -hmm. And so um, Appleton could have done anything they wanted with their prison. They could have rented it to the federal government. They could have done any number of things. But the state decided they were going to stop leasing beds. Um, I have carried legislation to ban private prisons for over a decade um, because we know, based on research, that um, they don't do as well. Um, they are cheaper, but actually ends up not being cheaper because you have higher levels of recidivism, you have more incidences, and the state ultimately when you lease a space mm -hmm. um, is responsible for all the cost related to that. Mm -hmm. And so um, in a cost effective manner as well as socially, um, there's just a problem with having private prisons. And so I've consistently been opposed to them. But it hasn't passed yet, has it? The banning of private prisons has not passed. Um, however, we don't use them. And well, so, except uh, there seem to be recurrent efforts on the part of the Republican now majority to uh, resurrect, for example, Appleton Prison. Yes. Are, am I yes. correct about that? Right. So the way you deal with an overpopulation of uh, inmates, which uh, currently the legislature has recognized we have an overpopulation of inmates, is you can either um, lease space somewhere else. Um, or you can try to figure out how to deal with your overpopulation. And Minnesota bipartisanly chose to actually deal with um, the overpopulation. Um, we increased the number of beds in our boot camp program so people could actually do a military style uh, boot oh, camp so sure. in order to uh, improve their outcomes mm -hmm. um, and get out of prison uh, okay. when they complete that program. Um, we changed drug sentencing in Minnesota. The bill passed unanimously. And so it the bill wasn't, passed unanimously? Yes. And so there was not this partisan rancor on how to change our uh, sentencing rules about drugs. Um, it, was, it was bipartisan. See, the best way to keep people out of prison is a job, right? We know that um, when people are in economically difficult times, um, whether it's um, because of a drug problem or a mental health problem or a chemical dependency problem, people act out in different ways. And ultimately, um, that's how we end up with many, many people uh, incarcerated. Mm. And so, um, I've worked on that in the legislature, and I believe that there are bipartisan solutions that we can come up with to help deal with those issues, and it doesn't have to be private prisons. So let's, I want to talk about another subject, which is uh, anti-bullying legislation, mm -hmm. which I think uh, uh, is another uh, uh, area that you've uh, been involved in in your ser service as a legislature, have you not? I have. So I've worked on anti-bullying legislation. It's always been uh, a broad group of people that want to come together. And I have to tell you that um, we are seeing more and more bullying in our schools now, um, but the tools are there to address the issue of bullying. And so we just need folks to, to do that. Um, we need to make certain that people know that it's not okay to bully. And I know that we um, sometimes see um, folks in elected office behave in a bullying kind of way, but um, Minnesotans um, have passed a law to say we don't agree with that and we believe that we need to make sure our students are safe no matter who they are or where they live. Why would anyone be opposed to anti-bullying legislation? Um, sometimes folks get confused about <laughs> whether it's bullying and some people like to say no it was just teasing. Mm -hmm. um, we want to make it really clear that mm -hmm. whether you think it's teasing or not it's about the receiver mm -hmm. of what you say and what you do mm -hmm. and it's not okay to bully people. It's not okay. And so we want to we want to climb it in our schools where students can go to school and learn right. and not have it be hostile for any reason. We don't want it to be about bullying. We don't want people to be touched that don't want to be touched, right, which gets to our campus sexual assault rules. I mean, we in Minnesota <coughs> believe that um, people have a right to go to school and get their education, whether it's elementary school or higher education. Is identity theft uh, something that uh, you are concerned about? And if so, have you had any occasion to uh, uh, adopt any uh, or promote any legislation that would address that? Sure, so I've actually worked on a lot of the identity theft legislation and worked on card skimming and many of the scams that you see in the area of, of senior fraud. And, and then in my day job, I've prosecuted cases mm -hmm. of um, fraud and identity theft. 
many, many folks are targeting senior citizens. You know, they might have a pension, they might have Social Security, and they have their house. And so people tend to go after senior citizens more because they believe that that's where they're going to find some of the money. And so in my job as a prosecutor, I actually um, traveled all over the state and trained folks on really? what do you look for? Um, who do you call? Where do you go? So I trained folks at credit card companies. I trained folks at banks. Folks from, folks from the Postal Service, mm -hmm. from the FBI, mm -hmm. um, on what do you look for? How do you spot these cases? And who do you call? Because in Minnesota, you have the Criminal Act, mm -hmm. but you might also have an act where the person needs um, adult protection services instead of just prosecution. Yeah. And so you need to make sure um, that people are taken care of. So I created the 1-800 number through legislation uh, back in 2009 that they just implemented in uh, 2016 so that if you suspect someone is being abused, neglected, financially exploited, a senior, you call one number and then um, they make certain that they get the details, whether it's to adult protection or whether it's to uh, law enforcement that needs to get the information. Really? So we just need to make sure that we give everyone the tools that they need to um, say no. If it seems too good to be true, it is. Yeah. And if it's concerning to you, don't. But if, you know, one of the problems it seems to me, uh, Deborah, is that it's not necessarily someone hitting an individual and stealing their identity theft. It's someone hacking into a system and stealing thousands or tens of thousands of identifications. Is that, is that a matter of just coming up with the proper software uh, that uh, would uh, uh, disable uh, the ability to do that? So every time we come up with good software, other Somebody people come up I with software that. to beat it. But it is about holding companies accountable who allow that to happen. And um, you're seeing that attorney generals across the country are stepping up together and they are going after the companies that have lost your data or allowed it to be stolen or not disclosed mm -hmm. um, that it was taken. In mm -hmm. Minnesota, we, um, we pride ourselves in respecting people's privacy and mm -hmm. data, and we believe that people have a right mm -hmm. to keep their data safe and secure. Mm -hmm. And so um, we believe that uh, you will see more suits related to the data breaches that have been happening. So I have two ifs here. Okay. Uh, if Attorney General Swanson does not run again, and should you secure the endorsement, what's going to be your campaign in a, in a general election? One of the things that I believe the role of the Attorney General is is to be a consumer advocate for Minnesotans, right? That is the job well, of the Attorney That's traditionally General. been the job, hasn't it? I mean, it is. I, you go back to Warren Spanis or even before, I think he's been a promoter of that. But uh, is, is it a sort of evolving thing as to what uh, consumer protection means? It is. So each and every time that there's a new group of folks, there's both a new group of bad guys in the business world, there's a new group of folks that are committing different kinds of scams. Mm -hmm. And so the job of the Attorney General is to look at what's happening, what's going on around you, and to do everything they can to protect consumers, mm -hmm. right? Whether that's suing insurance companies, whether that's suing credit card companies, whether that's going after a price uh, fixing that's happening right what, now. What about for banks them? opening mm -hmm. up uh, accounts for people that didn't really want those accounts and then charging them for that. Does that fall into the domain of the state attorney general or is that a federal matter? Well, you would have to look to see if your law allows you to do something about that. I see. They're Minnesota law, right? Okay. So so there are federal rules and there are Minnesota rules and you need to make certain that you um, see where you have jurisdiction, sure. right? And you're seeing that more and more that attorney generals are sharing jurisdiction. So like when somebody commits a crime, there are rules about can you prosecute that at the state level? Do you prosecute that at the city level? Do you take care sure. of that at the federal level? You also have that in the other areas of the world, right? Who has jurisdiction to take on these issues? And you're seeing that attorney generals across the country's jurisdiction are expanding more and more every day. Now, I know when you're out and about in 150 events, I mean, that's uh, like mind boggling. Mm -hmm. When did you start that process? S January. January. So since January, you, you've been out meeting uh, uh, scads of people, I'm sure. Yeah. You're telling them what uh, you intend to do, but what are they telling you? You must have been all over the state by now. I have been all over the state, and we've been hearing in different areas different things, right? So we heard a lot about um, Experian and what was happening with the data breach when that happened. Mm -hmm. We heard a lot about um, the cable companies and that happening. We're hearing about uh, the prices going up on um, people's medications, right? We're hearing about that, but ultimately they want the Minnesota Attorney General to stand up for consumers. They want to know that they can call and that their issue is going to be addressed. So that's your pledge. I will stand up for the average Minnesotan uh, and represent 
their interests uh, throughout my term. Is That's that, right. Have I stated that pretty correctly? That's exactly I'm just right. trying to summarize, but I think that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. I, I want to be Minnesotans' watchdog. I will be um, their fighter. Really great. That's Deborah, right. thank you for stopping by. Thank you so much. Democratic Visions is handcrafted by volunteers from Eden Prairie, Hopkins, Minnetonka, Edina, and Bloomington. Watch us on select community access cable TV channels and on our YouTube channel. This is Carol Sundstrom.